I want to welcome at this time uh, those who are uh, tuning in to Facebook, tuning in uh, on our website, tuning in on our app, all kinds of ways. Um, glad that you are with us here this morning. One of our great purposes uh, at Converge Church, it's, it's kind of there evident in the name already, isn't it? Come together. Uh, one of our great purposes is to really rub shoulders and make the gospel evident in relationship. And so we're absolutely delighted for anybody who is tuning in uh, this morning online, but we look forward to the day that possibly we can meet you face to face, shake your hands, and, and talk one another about the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, I hope that'll be possible one day soon if you're tuning in digitally this morning. A uh, few announcements, as usual, during this time. First of all, uh, Pastor Brian not here again this Sunday. A couple of Sundays he was planning to be out. Um, I think the family, some of you got the prayer request that uh, they are uh, recovering from COVID. I think that's all going well. Everything's in order there. Um, and he will be back next week. Next week he is going to start a new series that will be four Sundays long um, on Christian nationalism. We want to disconnect religious zeal from patriotism, all right? Patriotism can be a very, very good thing, encourage it, but we want to disconnect religious zeal from patriotism. So a four, four session series that's going to break up our Abraham series, and that will be on Christian nationalism beginning next week. Uh, back to school bash. Back to school. Next Sunday, uh, late afternoon, evening, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., we're going to be having a back-to-school bash out in the parking lot. Please, please, please be praying for good weather and be praying that lots of people who will, outside of our church, will accept the invitation to come that evening. We're going to have an enormous... Uh, inflatable children's inflatable out there. We're going to be serving food. We're going to have games, activities for all ages. And uh, we would like lots of people to come join us that we can host. Now, we would also love for you to come. Um, we've had regular Friday night fun nights, and it's always good to get whoever can make it on a Friday night to come out and have fellowship together and eat a hot dog. But we're putting special infinite, uh, emphasis on this one, all right? Because we do want to be good hosts to people who may join us that evening. And uh, so if you could come out, consider a couple of things. Uh, you could come out. Come and go as you please, 5 to 7 p.m., but if you can come out and help us, say 3.30 or 4, we're going to have a lot of setup to do outside there, and I would tremendously appreciate anybody who can come and, and lend a strong arm for setup, 3.30, 4 o'clock, something like that uh, on Sunday afternoon. Also, I need a generator. Uh, I hope I don't have to use it, but those inflatables take a, a, have a big power draw, and we're going to have a long extension cord. So I want to have a backup. If anybody has a generator that we could borrow and throw in a truck, get over here just in case. All right, I see, I see Joe. Thank you. Um, we want to be ready for uh, whatever comes. Ginny, why don't you come on up? Um, Ginny Harriger has an announcement regarding our women's Bible studies. Yes. Hi. I am so excited to be up here. Um, I cannot believe we're talking fall already. I can't <laughs> believe school is back in session. But the exciting thing about that is that means Bible studies are going to start up again. Um, I don't know what you guys are doing. You're on your own for that. I have to figure that one out. Um, but for the ladies, we have two studies available this fall. Um, starting on September 13th, Every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., Deb Harold will be leading a study right down the hall here, and they will be studying Genesis. Um, Deb isn't here this morning, so I can't have her um, raise her hand, but if anybody comes to that study, who usually comes to Deb's study? Anybody here? Raise your hand. If you're thinking about it, come and find somebody that had their hand up and ask about it. But um, you can just show up on the 13th, but if you want to talk to Deb ahead of time, if you have any questions, or um, if you want to get a book, you can do that, but you don't need the book, you can just show up on the 13th. Um, also, on Tuesday evenings, 
This one starts on August 23rd. That's in like two weeks, you guys, okay? Every other Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., we'll be meeting in the room down at the end of the hall, and we will be doing a, a video Bible study on the book of Ruth. And I am so excited about this. I watched the trailer, and I just got real excited, and I couldn't hardly wait to facilitate that. So we have the trailer coming up now, so I'm going to get out of the way, and I hope it gets you excited and wants to come. Thanks. Welcome to the land of the down and out, where dreams have been dashed and lives have been lost. This is a place where no one wants to be, and yet, that is where the Book of Ruth starts. Bitter Naomi and friendly Ruth roll up to Bethlehem. Naomi has no money, no husband, no sons, no land. She isn't saying words like, glory to God for he is good, or hashtag bless. She tells them, I have lost everything and I'm bitter. And if you're honest, Maybe you feel like her, and I welcome you here. Just because it looks hopeless doesn't mean that all hope is lost. Things are going to change for Ruth and Naomi. They're heading into the harvest season, not just metaphorically or spiritually, but physically as well. Dear child of God, your story is not done. Like Ruth and Naomi, you may not see what is coming up, but hope is on the horizon. If you are not dead, then God is not done. Whether you are single, married, divorced, or widowed, you are wanted by your Redeemer. In the midst of utter hopelessness, can we fight for hope because their Redeemer lives? As we head into Bethlehem through the pages of Scripture, I want you to discover your name in the midst of whatever your situation is. Not the name that was given to you at birth, but the name that God whispers over you at birth. Child of God, you are mine. Very good. Thank you, Jenny. Hope you ladies will take advantage of one of those Bible studies, however that fits into your schedule. Let us pray, shall we? And we'll prepare to look into God's Word in Genesis chapter 18. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the blessings of being your children, one of which, one of the foremost of which is the ability to, to pray uh, to pray both individually and privately in our prayer closet, to pour out the most intimate dynamics of our soul, to confess our love for you, declare our loyalty to you, but also to come and to gather in a place such as this one, to sit down with other brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ and to lift up our prayers to intercede for others, and to sing our praises um, all together gathered. Heavenly Father, I want to pray this morning as we are on the verge of a new season. We, we very easily relate to the idea of seasons starting in the fall with school. And that means the kickoff of all kinds of events. It means the, the kickoff of um, our our preschool and Thrive events, the main target of our back-to-school bash next Sunday. I do pray that you would bless the work of our hands as our invitations go out to, uh, to families who are not a part of our church. I pray that they would receive that invitation gladly and that they would be able to sense uh, the warmth of our hearts towards them and the desire to be good hosts and to bless them with a fun night at the beginning of this school season. Heavenly Father, I pray for our women's Bible studies that have just been announced. I pray that this would um, be times of refreshing for our gals as they come together and look into God's Word. I pray that um, their minds would be sharpened, that, the, that their hearts would be warmed, and uh, that they would be filled with the wonder of what you have revealed in your Word and changed forever as your Holy Spirit applies it to their hearts. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for all of our students, young and old, who are um, returning to the classroom here at this time. We pray that you would protect their minds. There's lots of things going around out there, not all of which line up with your word. 
And we pray that you would protect them from the influence of the world and that you would enable them to be strong for the faith. I pray that you would bless teachers. I pray that you would give them wisdom as they work with unique constraints in today's world. I pray that you'd bless them and allow them to do their work in a godly fashion. Heavenly Father, we pray again today for Ukraine and we pray for our uh, sister church in Ananyev. Uh, we were so delighted to hear the report from Jim Capaldo this last week from the train and uh, we pray that your hand of blessing would continue to be on that church as they shine a light in a very, very difficult difficult circumstance. Bless them, we pray. And now, Heavenly Father, as we look into your word, we ask that you would, by your spirit, open it up to us. Give us a level of obje objectivity that's not yours, usually ours. Uh, so often, uh, we're used to our own uh, perspective being the barometer, being the, being the compass, being the guide, being the truth-o-meter. But as we look into your word, we want your word to be the authority, the final word for us. And so enable us to listen to the voice of your Holy Spirit as you teach us today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis again. Genesis chapter 18, we're going to cover uh, quite a bit of um, scripture this morning. I don't want you to get nervous about that. Um, 18 and 19, unfortunately, because of a long story, we're going to have to uh, skim over a little bit to try to put the, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to work my iPad and talk at the same time. Um, for a fellow my age, not a, not a good scenario. We're going to just follow the story of Abraham, as I suggested as we got going, um, we come to that story in Genesis that is troubling, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, but we're going to try to track and stick just with our teacher, Abraham, as we consider his venture faith and attempt to make it our own. So Genesis chapter 18, uh, beginning at verse 16, is where we'll start this morning. Um, maybe you're aware of it. I, I think you probably are. There comes a point when you just can't take it any more. Anybody? Uh, uh, <laughs> a moment that you can't take it anymore. Uh, at, we call that a tipping point. And I just thought maybe as we get started and we think about a tipping point and not being able to take it anymore, you'd give me a little bit of interaction. Um, I'm wondering this morning if you have a noticeable tell. You know, a tell, like when you're playing no, you don't play poker, do you? Anyway, uh, when you play <laughs> Dutch Blitz, um, I, <laughs> do you have a tell when you've come to the place where it, you've reached a tipping point? Anybody want to volunteer? Parents don't because then they'll give it away to their kids. But uh, tipping point? No one wants to. Oh, Tim's got one. You going to share it with us, Tim? No, <laughs> I've taken him right to that edge now, so <laughs> look carefully, right? Tipping point, you know what it is? Stress clean, you are not the only one, Katie. Uh, we have at least one, maybe a few in our family who stress clean. And if all of a sudden it gets really, really energetic, uh, yeah, okay, we're there. We're at that tipping point. Anybody else? What's your tipping point? Maybe that's something you could discuss later around the dinner table. What's your tell that you've gotten close to the tipping point? You know the tipping point as an employee. You know what it like, it's like to reach the edge as a parent. You even know it as a sibling when you've had just about enough and you're going to go over the edge. 19th century French sociologist Emile Durkheim believed that it's true not just of individuals, but it's also true of societies. Societies. So think countries, certainly, United States of America. Think also, though, communities, smaller communities. Think Omaha or Millard 
or the school that you're in, all right? Think churches. Even think families. Wherever there's an organized group that we call, well, that's sort of an individual society, Durkheim suggested that they have a tipping point. The Durkheim constant, as it has come to be known, proposes that when deviancy, okay? By deviancy, I mean whatever is outside the norm, all right? We call certain things normal, and we call some things abnormal. And he said that whenever things are abnormal, like crime, or even uh, broken homes, or, or mental illness, or, or something else, whenever what is not normal reaches a tipping point in society, we adopt a form of denial. Interesting. Interesting to think about. We deal with a deviancy epidemic by simply defining away most of it. You see what he's saying? He's saying, so if, if here's what normal is, if, if, if right in between here is where normal is, and abnormal starts to push and go above the tipping point or the saturation point, what do we do? We move the bottom up. And so that we can include more things as normal. So things that were previously defined as being abnormal, out of bounds, deviant, we draw the target a little bit bigger. And we say, no, no, we reassure, we reassure everyone in our society, no, we're okay. <laughs> we're okay. We can still hold together because we still agree it's, it's normal. It's normal. And this is what happens when a society reaches a tipping point. Judge Robert Bork said that it gets even worse. He said, once bad behavior is defined down to become the new normal, those who hold to traditional moral values of the past are turned on because they're now the ones who are abnormal. The traditional value suddenly becomes the deviant one that can't be accepted. Does any of this sound familiar? Does any of this sound like what we're experiencing in our country today? I think we would all agree, yeah. We might pick our own examples of what seems to really, you know, mm, that takes me to the tipping point but we would probably all have examples to give when what is, was clearly unacceptable becomes widely accepted, you know you're at the tipping point. You'll recall from the Abraham narrative that Lot chose the fruited plains, didn't he? Abraham said, Lot, you go ahead and choose, and Lot chose the fruited plains. It's a decision that put him in orbit around Sodom and Gomorrah. Eventually, as you track the story, you see Lot settling down in the suburbs of Sodom, and when you finally get to the crisis of this story, he's living in Sodom, inside the walls. Eventually, we see Lot in the suburbs. Finally, he's in the heart of the town, and it turns out to be a fateful decision. Here's the way our story, this part of the narrative, looks this morning. We're going to see that the Lord reveals to Abraham that his righteousness is on an exploratory mission. He reveals to Abraham, I'm going down to sea. Abraham understands where this is going to end up. He knows already, even though the Lord doesn't tell him the end. Abraham knows where this is going. And he intercedes for the cities on the basis of God's, we're going to draw this out, on the basis of God's justice. Then Lot's family is dragged from Sodom, but Sodom remains in his family. We won't have time to look at that much. But Lot is forcibly dragged out of the city of Sodom, and then we see later in the story that Sodom has stuck. It can't be taken out of his family. 
Finally, we'll see, we'll pick it up again, Abraham looks out over the smoking rubble of God's judgment. Lot relocated to Sodom, and that decision got him into trouble. You know what? I didn't relocate to Sodom. Sodom has moved to me. Am I right? Now, I don't want to say that these times in America are worse than any. If you study American history closely, you even go back just shortly, a few decades after the, after the Civil War and, and the birth of our nation, and it was a horrible time in our country. There have been times when our civilization, our society, has been at the tipping point below, or below. We see now, though, that we're at a tipping point again. And here's the question for today as we study Abraham. What does God expect of people who see Sodom out their window and realize that their town is at the tipping point? What does God expect of us who make these observations about our own town or our own country? So Genesis chapter 18. Would you look at that with me? Genesis 18, and we're at verse 16 to begin this story. Then the men set out from there, that is from Abraham's tent at Mamre, and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. This was Abraham's role. So that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. And then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I'll know. I will know. Verse 17 that we just saw there. Verse 17. God says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Shall I conceal? Shall I just walk on? Or shall I reveal to him what I am going to do? And then the Lord did reveal to Abraham what he was up to because, number one, Abraham was destined to be the means of blessing to the world. That was the covenant. Not just that he was going to have children, we're still waiting for the fulfillment of that promise in our story, but because he was supposed to be a blessing to the world. Secondly, he revealed to him what he was going to do because he was intended to be a teacher of righteousness. He was supposed to be a model and an example to the world of what righteousness and justice look like. There is a very clear passage that takes us a little farther down to the story. You remember, quite a few years from now, we're going to get to Moses and the giving of the law, right? Listen to these words um, where Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, the world, the nations, the Goya, the non-Israelites. This is going to be a shining example of wisdom and understanding. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? So this was Abraham's destiny. It was the destiny of his progeny, those who would come after him, that he would be a teacher to the world of what righteousness and justice was supposed to look like. And so the Lord says, I will reveal to him, he's going to see me in the circumstances, he's going to walk through this experience with me in order to learn righteousness and justice. In verse 21, 
The Lord reveals to Abraham, he says, I will go down and see if it's as bad as they're crying. As they're crying. That's an interesting word there. The outcry is not rebellion. The word there in the Hebrew represents wailing, anguish. It's the cry of the victim. I'm going to go see what all of this anguished outcry, this victimization is all about. And I think that's very interesting because the picture of Sodom and Gomorrah, both in this chapter and in 19, is that there are no victims, only perpetrators. I won't solve that riddle for you, but you might stew on that for a little while. God says, I'm here a lot of victims crying out in anguish. But when he goes down to visit, he makes it very clear that the only ones to be saved would be Lot and his family. Hmm. Note that the Lord doesn't say what he's going to do. He simply reveals that he's going to explore what's going on, but Abraham knows, doesn't he? You ever have your parents, maybe your mother or your father, say to you, I'm coming in there and I better not find you out of bed. You know there's judgment attached to that, right? And this is exactly what God is revealing to Abraham. I'm going to go see what all this crying is going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham goes, Boop. right? Just like you did when you were tipping outside of your bed. Boop. Something bad's going to happen. So we see here in the first part of this text, venture faith spreads God's blessing, that's Abraham's role, with the sobering knowledge that judgment is looming. Abraham's and yours. Abraham's and yours. Venture faith does this. It spreads God's blessing. Venture faith spreads God's blessing with the sobering knowledge that judgment is looming. I read the text to you this morning. God has revealed not only to Abraham where this leads, he has revealed to us. In fact, it's so clear we can't miss it in 2 Peter chapter 2. By turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. God didn't just reveal it to the venture faith that was Abraham's. He did it for the venture faith that is ours as well. So your mission is to go out and spread the good news. You're supposed to spread the gospel. You're supposed to share the blessings that can be ours in Jesus Christ. But you do it. You do it knowing that judgment is on the horizon. You do it with great fear and trembling for those who will not believe. You do it knowing that the judgment is very real. Let's continue the story. Picking it up at verse 22. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. I'm going to cut it off there because I'm going to be pushed for time here, but you remember the story of Abraham bargaining with the Lord. Will you, for 50? How about less? Would, would you spare judgment for less? And he bargains with the Lord. So what are Abraham's concerns? He's concerned about collateral damage, if you want to put it in modern terminology. Isn't that what he's getting at? What about collateral damage, Lord? Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? If your judgment rains down on this people, aren't some innocent folks going to get hurt in the process? He's concerned with corporate righteousness. Corporate righteousness. Abram says in verse 24, will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous? He says, I know that there is a corporate reputation there. There's, it's Sodom. It stands together. You know the old phrase, there's no I in team. Um, but won't you, spend, won't you spare the team 
if there's just a few righteous? So he's worried about collateral damage. He's worried about corporate righteousness. And then he starts to get very number specific, and they negotiate down to 10. Now, I realized this week that I've always gotten this just a little bit wrong, mostly right. I give myself a B, B plus, something like that. But here's what I missed. I always thought, well, you're negotiating with God. If you're pleading for anyone's life, then you must be pleading for that person's life on the basis of God's mercy, right? Right? Well, you know, yeah, I said I got something wrong, so you're not going to say, uh-huh, walk into that trap. No. Hey, well, yes, you do plead for someone on the behalf of God, on, on the basis of God's mercy, but is that what happens in the story? That's where I got lost. I went with the default, oh, I'm pleading, he's pleading with God for the end, right? Yeah, it must be his mercy. But that's not the basis on which he pleads. He pleads on the basis of God's Anybody venture out there? Justice. Very interesting. On the basis of God's justice, Lord, spare the city for the sake of the righteous citizens. Spare them all because, Lord, does it seem right that, that there would be collateral damage? Is that necessary? And on the basis of justice, he bargains with the Lord. Hmm. That needs some fleshing out, but venture faith pleads on the basis of God's justice, knowing that in society the good often suffer with the evil. I, absolutely. Plead for your loved ones, plead for your city, plead for your nation by appealing to God's mercy. But that's not the point of this story. There's another angle that we may have missed where God encourages Abraham, and I believe encourages us, to plead for deliverance based on his justice. Consider a couple of things here that are really, they may seem simple, but they are mind-blowing. God is willing to consider the intercession of the righteous. That is no small thing. But he models it here in the story that God is willing to consider the intercession of the righteous as it pertains to his judgment. Consider number two, God is willing to postpone judgment on behalf of the righteous. Both of those are enormous things to hold on to. Enormous. What it tells us that God's justice is not an electric fence. It's not an electric fence. It's not an unthinking, unfeeling sort of a device. When I was a kid working out on the farm, I remember I was working with my cousin, and he asked me to go take some water to the, the trough where the sheep were. And they were outdoor, but there was a, a trough that kind of backed right up to the, the corner of that lot, and there was uh, a electric wire, electric fence around that. So I filled up this nice big metal bucket, five gallons of water, and I went over to that trough, and he was busy elsewhere, and I started pouring that water. I didn't want to miss it, you know, so I'm pouring that in. And the old electric fence straight across the forehead, you know. Whoa! That, well, that's an unbending, unyielding, unfeeling, unthinking rule, that electric fence, Right? There is no giving, there's no take, there's no postponing judgment. It just happens. But that's not the picture of God's judgment as we get it here because God interacts with Abraham and allows this intercession to take place. Now chapter 19 is the sordid story of the Lord's emissaries visiting Sodom. The immoral advances of the townspeople and the iniquity of that culture. Chapter 19 is the sordid story of the Lord's emissaries visiting Sodom. And it picks up at verse 15. We're going to skip most of that. Just jump down to chapter 19, verse 15, if you will. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up! 
Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. Uh, key note there, same word, lest you be swept away. Same word that Abraham used, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked. Uh, verse 16, but he lingered, that is Lot, Lot lingered. So the men, these angelic visitors, seized him. Yeah, it's what it seems to be. They grabbed him, seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. Swept away. Verse 15, that same word, swept away. Verse 16, the angels have to drag lingering Lot and his family out of the city. Verse 16, the Lord, being merciful to him, drug him out of that city, knowing that judgment was about to, be, was about to fall. Some will be rescued through the prayers of ventured, venture faith. Encouragement to you. Uh, is there someone in your life, friend or family, who is yet far from the Lord? Is there someone, friend or family, in, uh, that in your awareness that may have a relationship with God in Christ Jesus, but is daring the discipline of God by walking away? Daring the discipline of His heavenly Father by walking away? Here is encouragement some will be rescued. Some will be rescued by your intercession. Pray, pray, pray. Do not give up. Pray. Some will be rescued. Have you heard of the prayer meeting revival in American history? Prayer meeting revival. It was exactly noon on September 23, 1857, a little more than uh, 100 and what, 150 years ago, a tall, middle-aged former businessman climbed creaking stairs to the third story of an old church building in the heart of lower New York City. He called a prayer meeting. No one showed. No one showed. Well, a little while later, he sat and he prayed, and before the end of the meeting, six people showed. Within months, there were prayer meetings all over New York, New York City, and they were filled to capacity. Historians tell us that within two years, it's estimated a million converts were added to American churches, another million in England and Ireland. It started with one person who called a prayer meeting, followed by six who joined him followed by many others who were willing to pray with just this hope that some will be rescued through the prayers of venture faith. Then we get to the end of the story. As I promised, verse 27, Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, I looked this up. I couldn't get exactly the... the uh, geography that I was hoping for. I, I think it's about 15 miles from where he was down to the southern edge uh, where they believe Sodom and Gomorrah were. And he looked down there and toward all the land of the valley and he saw and behold the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah. You wonder why this detail and what was on Abraham's mind as he looked and saw the destruction. I think I know. <laughs> I think I know because we're told that the whole event, God let him in on the whole event for a purpose. I think he looked down and he saw the fires burning and he thought, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And he says, in spite of what I see, I know what I believe because I interceded with God and I know God has acted with justice. When the smoke of judgment clears, venture faith will be found standing at the place of intercession. 
you are going to be one day in glory, in heaven, you will be at the place of intercession and you will be aware of the judgment of God. Use the time that you have to pray. Use the time to intercede. Society has a tipping point. Society has a tipping point. The trouble is society will continually redefine acceptable in order to maintain its balance. It will deny tipping. Society wants to deny that there's a tipping. Society's, ah, pff, judgment of God, schmudgment of God. Society has a tipping point. God's righteousness has a tipping point, and he refuses to dumb it down. The righteous may suffer as their society passes God's tipping point. The righteous may suffer in that process. But God's righteousness is patient in the pursuit of justice, and God's people are invited to pray. Society has a tipping point. God's righteousness has a tipping point. Now, here's one more. And you have a tipping point. You have a tipping point. I want to give you this challenge. I, I, I think I speak to people um, who on occasion look at the headlines and are frustrated and want to tear your hair out. Don't do it. It's permanent. Um, over what's going on in our country. You've reached a tipping point, and no matter what your tell is, you let it out. You, you, you revealed somewhere along the line your tell that you're at the, the limit of your ability, and you feel like you're not going to take it anymore. I want to challenge every one of you today. When you're talking with someone, and that conversation is critical about trends in our country, and you realize maybe not just you, but maybe together you're both at a tipping point. You're frustrated. You realize that our country has been extraordinarily, been extraordinarily blessed by being founded on biblical principles at the very least. And yet we're squandering that foundation. And as you get more and more frustrated, and as you get talking and you get closer and closer to your tipping point, would you ask that person to pray with you that God would withhold judgment for the sake of the innocent? You see, I'm afraid too often we just go with it. We hit our tipping point, and all we do is tend to express venom with like-minded people. We start preaching to the choir, and we get all worked up about how bad it is and how far we've gone and how God's righteousness is going to tip and judgment is going to fall and all that may be true, but it skips the latter half of this and the responsibility of Venture Faith which says, pray. Then pray. And I also want you to note that the, that the righteous people in this story were relatively righteous people. And I want you to pray for God's justice in our country that those who are a little bit less bad than the worst would not be caught up in the judgment of those who are the worst. That's an Abrahamic venture prayer. It's not only just, it's merciful. It's compassionate. Would you pray? When you feel yourself, I'm getting sucked in. I'm mad as hell, just like you are. Oh, let's pray. Let's pray. Because you know when God's judgment falls, innocent people tend to get swept up in that judgment as well. Let's pray. Let's pray that God will withhold, that God will rescue the righteous, that God will be patient and rescue the righteous. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. It's troubling on a number of different fronts, and it it's, takes us a while to sort through this. Um, when we come face to face with the severity of your judgment based on absolute righteousness, it's startling. It's scary. But we also see here traces that cannot be swept away of your heart of compassion, 
we also see here uh, responsibility on those who have been called by you to influence the world towards righteousness, justice. We also feel a call in our lives to pray, to intercede, intercede. Lord, I pray that we would be like your son, Jesus. He loved us while we were still enemies, enemies. It made it possible for us to have peace. As we face adversaries in our world, our enemies are not flesh and blood, but oftentimes flesh and blood are communicating the value of our enemy. And as we experience that and, and our own righteousness is provoked, may we not rush to judgment, but may we pray honorably for patience and for justice that will preserve, protect, and keep even as we near your tipping point. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's no better place to witness the righteousness and the justice and the mercy and the grace of God all coming together in one place. No better place than right here as we observe the Lord's Supper together. It all came together at the cross. It all came together there where His judgment was poured out on Jesus Christ in a way that meant glory and life and living for the rest of us. These gentlemen are passing out a couple of cups stacked. This is going to take a little technique. Uh, it takes two hands if you would just separate the bread on the bottom from the juice that's on the top and hold on to that. We've got the kids with us this morning. We're delighted to have them with us during our communion services. We want to remind ourselves, first of all, that this bread, this, just this little tiny bit of bread, represents the body of Jesus Christ. He said, whenever you eat this bread, I want you to remember that this represents my body, which was broken for you. And he tells us, now, be careful. Be careful, because this is special. This is, this is different from just finding a little bit of bread and, and juice somewhere and just gobbling that up because it looks tasty. This has a, a symbolic meaning that says you're one with Jesus. So be careful and do it reverently. Now, doing it reverently means not only that it testifies to the truth about your relationship with Jesus, that you've trusted Jesus, it really means that you're walking with him. And so Paul encourages us, uh, judge yourself before you get judged. He says, examine your own heart and, and do this in a manner that's worthy of the Lord. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever to be walking away from the Lord and hiding your face from him and at the same time proclaiming that you're one with him. So, have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Secondly, are you close to Him by confession of sin? This bread says that you are one with Jesus, and when we do this together, we like to do it sort of like that. Would you hold your cup up with me? This is a toast. I am one with, fill it in, I am one with Jesus. After the bread, Jesus took a cup. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. In the very same fashion, he says, your participation in this is a symbol that you participate in the new covenant. We're together. The promise binds us. That my destiny is your destiny. I am one with Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all that it means to us. And as we stand in awe and, and maybe even a little bit of shock as we consider 
what has become of Sodom and Gomorrah and that example. And as we remember your words, that there was worse for some, even worse, who've had the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ in person and yet have denied him. As we remember the awfulness of your judgment, we are also captivated by the wonder of your grace. It fills our hearts, captures our attention, and it gives us hope. And so we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So glad you've been with us this morning. Uh, if you have been uh, with us by way of the internet, uh, we thank you for your participation in our service. If you've got any questions, you can either respond on the internet, you can uh, send me an email at mike at convergechurchomaha.org, or if you're here sitting in one of our chairs, you can fill out the little form that's underneath. Feel free to ask me a question in per person on that form. Uh, love to keep this conversation going. We're going to be dismissing from the service now, and uh, many of our people will go out and have small groups, community groups we call them, to discuss the sermon. And a thorny one like this would be a great way, one to talk through with some other people. So this is why we do it, because we want it to be a conversation and not just a monologue. So if you're not part of one of those community groups, wow, we'd love to have you join. Test it out, try it out, and see if it's a benefit to you. Work through some of these thorny questions with some like-minded people, will you? All right, let's stand, shall we? Let's sing that theme song as we uh, encourage each other out this morning. <laughs>